Okay, good morning viewers. Uh, absolutely delighted to welcome you back to Plug TV and another fantastic round and an amazing boxer. In fact, probably the, the biggest, causing the biggest upset in British boxing history. We have this morning on online, John H. Stracy. Welcome to the show. Uh, thank you very much. It's great to be on. No, fantastic. And as I was saying, this, this show started out from small humbling beginnings and, and now it's... Uh, yeah, it's growing, yeah. growing with some traction, and, and the viewers are really, really, you know, interested to hear about past champions and their lives and and everything that you've been through, John. So, I believe you retired, and not to not to make you feel old here by any stretch, but I believe you retired in the year I was born. So it'd be great to it'd be, <laughs> be retired from boxing. That is. Um, and yeah. it'd be, be be great to to obviously learn a little bit more about your story, and and I've done some. Good research in, into it and and what what a story it is yeah well it's it's i think coming from the east end is the story really because as a as a young lad living in bethnal green you know um living in in old buildings uh council buildings as you know you you don't go to the greatest schools you don't go you don't have the greatest place to live and it's all free for all fights and football fights football fights and and then you just sort of establish yourself as you go along and and as a kid I, what, the reason i started boxing if if that's what you want to know was um because I, I you know i was very small believe it or not when i when i left school i was 15 when i left school 15 and a half i was seven stone seven wow which is not big no so as a young lad growing up i was always getting picked on played football you know someone had knocked me and then i punching back and doing all things like that and so I grew up with not not being bullied because no one really came up to me and bullied me but what happened was um I'd have fights and I'd, I'd punch them good and then you know uh, their parents had come up the flat where we lived in Bethnal Green and say look what your son's done to my son <laughs> he's hit him <laughs> and I'd just turn around and say well dad he hit me first so I, did, I didn't punch him for you know and I never did Believe it or not, I never ever started on anyone. Um, so my dad in the end said, right, I've had enough of this, keep fighting all the time. He said, I'm going to take you to a boxing club. So he took me to a Repton Boxing Club in, in London, Bethnal Green, which is the most successful boxing club in, in, in uh, Great Britain. It's had more champions than any other club. So I went along as 11 and a half, 12 year old and uh, never looked back from there, obviously, you know. What, what was nice about it, I, you know, in my whole career, I'd won everything I ever got in for as an amateur. I'd won five national titles out of seven. I was a semi-finalist and finalist in the other. Um, and I won five, you know, five championships of Great Britain. And I boxed the Olympic Games in Mexico. And then I was British, European, undefeated champ, you know, and, world and, and champ. Not, 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 not to mention there, John, gold medalist as well, I believe, yeah? No, 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 no. I wasn't gold medalist. You no. weren't. I got that a bit wrong then. No, no. I tell you what, you got it wrong. No, I tell you what happened. This is brilliant. I boxed a guy, um, Ronnie Harris, who went on to win the gold medal from America. Him and George Foreman won the gold medals for America that year, and I was the only one. I was eighteen and three weeks age. Right, I was the youngest ever, and I, I lost on a majority decision to him. Okay. But he beat everybody else uh, five nil. You know, he beat them all um, easily. And then he went on to win the gold medal. But not only did he win the gold medal, he won what they call the Val Barker Trophy, which is the best boxer of the whole of the games out of all the finals. Wow. And so, you know, losing to a guy like that who went on to win it and then, as a, a, and, and then lose it as um, a majority was the best thing that could have ever happened to me. And, um, you know, it, it, it was my, and that, that really what has established me to, to turn professional uh, the next year when I, when I, you know, finished the Olympics. So it I was mean, great. Gro gro you mentioned there, so obviously growing up Bethnal Green and, and living in the East End yeah. and, and fighting from a young age and scrapping around a little bit, but obviously you, you packed a hard punch. I mean, I, I've done a bit of research, as I say, and 45, um, 45 winning yeah. 37 knockouts right so um, yeah that, that's an incredible stat yeah it, it's actually would you believe the third best in welterweight division of all time um there's there's one there's one guy who's 77 
one guy who's 74, then me next, 73% of knockouts. So it's the third best in, in the whole world. Uh, you know, so I'm very, very proud of that. Amazing, amazing. And, and yet, like, um, you know, and again, we've got lots of different viewers watching this from different sports, but um, you remember the losses as well, sadly. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're the ones that hurt. <laughs> well, you know, it, it's very strange because this is a, a fact. The first fight I ever lost, um, it was so, so close. And uh, it was, it was, I think it was half a point in them days. And I've still got, funny enough, I've still got the, the write-ups from that time because my dad done a book for me and all the papers and, and all the papers, probably four or five of the papers all thought that I'd won it. Said, so you know, we thought he'd won it, but I lost by half a point, which is like one round. And uh, so, so really, you know, I, it, it, I, I classed it as a win because uh, so many writers put, they thought I'd won it. And then I've got, disqualified which was ridiculous you know I never even hit him low uh, for the British title then I got nutted by a guy and then we all know what Dave Boy Green did you know nothing again and so the only genuine loss if you want to look at it that way was when I lost to Carlos Palomino so re really the other four could have gone my way if, if you know what I mean I love that but listen, that's, that's, yeah, that's, that's, that's the positive mindset and, and obviously what I'm trying to yeah. here is there's two ways to look at everything yeah well there is yeah but you know the great thing is you know to, to lose you know if you look at it to lose five out of 51 and have 37 knockouts i mean yeah, yeah I even say, say it myself and i'm not trying to be big headed in any way it is it is a very good uh, percentage so i'm happy with that i had 130 odd amateur fights as well so you know i've done it all and and uh, mm -hmm. it, it, it's been great i mean boxing you know, is is fantastic, and you get it all right, and it, it it's it's the greatest sport in the world. And and believe it or not, there's um, I mean, I, I actually started training. Um, I've never been in the ring. Um, I'm a lover, not a fighter. I'm st I stand at six foot five and a half. So um, oh. I, tra I tra trained with a good friend of mine, uh, Dave Early. He's got a, a fantastic um, sort of spit and sawdust training camp, and it's incredible. And that's actually where I met uh, yeah. met up with Frank Bruno. Um, but the training that it requires, and obviously the commitment, the dedication, the the movement patterns. There's so much synergy between that and the rotation of uh, of golf. And and I know you're you're an avid golfer as well, John. So um, yeah, yeah. Just just tell the viewers, you know, your handicap, or your lowest handicap that you've. Well, ever... I, used to, I used to be 11 when I lived in Bournemouth. I had a hotel many many years ago in Bournemouth in the 70s. So I used to play a lot then, so um, and I was 11 then. But now I'm about 18. I, but I don't play as much as I, I used to at all. But I'm also a lefty, you know, left-handed. Oh, okay. And that's not good after time. <laughs> this course <laughs> isn't made for left-handers. <laughs> and yet, we've got, we've got Bubba, maybe you should just go and play Augusta. Bubba Watson, Phil, Phil Mickelson, Major Jack. Oh, there we go. unbelievable players. But, um, I, 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 went, I went many, many years ago in the 70s. I went to see... It used to be called the Piccadilly Match Play. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And it was at uh, Wentworth. Amazing. And I went, I used to go there. Now, I went 1975. I'm just trying to think who won it that year, 75. And I'm not sure if it was Gary Player, but he won it four or five, three or four times, I think, Gary Player. Um, and then I went that year and I saw uh, Tom Watson hit the ball. And so, so, you know, all, all the old golfers then, it was unbelievable. Yeah, great, great. You know, yeah. what the house, you, know, you know what the house prices were then? Around Wentworth. Wentworth. Oh, this, yeah. would be, this would be interesting. I mean, I know what they are now. I'll tell, um, I'll tell you what they were then. You could buy a house there for 55 grand in 75, 76. You would have been now, I believe them. they're about 7, 8 million, 10 million. Oh, and, and yeah. even. So it just shows you how times have changed. Absolutely. So, um,. Yeah. So, so back to your your career, and obviously your your yeah. icon, you, the iconic moment. So you're going in as a as a as a big underdog, and and, and you rock up down in Mexico City. And it, if anybody wants to to you know check this fight out, then get on oh, YouTube, yeah. and, and it's amazing. I mean, watching that, you've just gone into that ring, John, with so much swagger. Uh, I mean, can you just tell me a little bit about how you're yeah, feeling? Yeah, and yeah. incredible. Yeah. Well, I tell I tell you what. What was really a big help was because I boxed in the Olympics uh, seven years previous, 
in Mexico City. Um, I knew exactly how to train, the altitude, you know, how it, how it was. I mean, I boxed in December. Um, we was there in September, October for the Olympics. So there's not a great big difference in the, in the climate. So we knew if I could stay there three weeks to a month, which we did, it was, it was a month, um, we, I could acclimatise much better, you know, be, 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 be great. And so that's what we did. Um, but Napoli's, funny enough, Napoli's wasn't aware that I'd boxed in the Olympics. Okay. So he wouldn't come over here to fight. And I think they wanted to get me over there. And then obviously with the heat and the, the atmosphere, the altitude, um, and, I would have... And again, just for the listeners, his point of view, his, his, his name, Jose Napolis, but no... Jose, no... yeah, Jose, he, he's, he's, he's went out as Jose Napolis, but his nickname was Mantequilla, which uh, smooth as butter. Beautiful. That was it. But he, he was actually, can I just say this? He was actually Cuban. Okay. He came from Cuba. But um, if you remember, Castro, Fidel Castro banned all uh, professional sports in the 60s. And so he moved to Mexico and he became an iconic hero in Mexico. Um, and so, you know, yeah. And, and But anyway, when I, when I got to, uh, um, when I went to Mexico the second time, um, I just knew, you know, how to train, what to do, because I'd been there before. And funnily enough, three years earlier, I'd actually sparred Jose Napoles in London, would you believe? Because he was boxing my stable mate, Ralph Charles, who was the welterweight British champion. And I used to be, me and Ralph used to spar all the time. And so we was like trying to find out his best moves, his worst moves. So I went to the gym in London and sparred him. And my manager, Terry Lawless at the time, said to me, in the last round, I'd, put, I'd done four with him. He said, in the last round, he said, just throw your jab. He said, don't throw any other punches, not, not your right hand or hooks just jab so he said as if you haven't got your right arm just jab so i did i just jab 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 for for like three minutes and i must have hit him well loads of times and anyway when we get in the car going back to the gym going back to our gym in, in london he said uh, i said to him why, why did you want me just to hit with the jab he said because the way you hit him i watched it in one of the rounds he said, you, you know, his head went back. He said, and I think if you ever box him in the future, he said, you're, you know, the jab will beat him. And strangely enough, that was three years before. That was 1972. And so in three years' time, I did fight him. And, it, and if you have a look at the fight, the jab plays a very, very important part in the win. Amazing. So it was good advice. I, mean, I love watching it. I mean, the um, how commentary has changed in TV, hey? I mean... Uh, uh, I mean, br brilliant watch. In fact, as I say, anybody watching this, just get online on YouTube and check that fight out because it's incredible. So, I mean, he, he was, if I believe I'm, I'm right in saying this, he was he was reigning champion for six years. Is that correct? Well, what happened? Yeah, he, 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 he beating a guy called Curtis Coates, who sadly died last week um, for the title in 1969. Then he held it for two years. Then he boxed a guy called Billy Backus and he got a, a, an eye cut. And he lost his title, but within the next fight, he got it back. And then he reigned until I beat him. I think he had something like 15 defences. That's, that's so it's always, great, the, always great being there. He, taking he, he was one of the all time greats. And, you know, uh, uh, but I tell you where I won the crowd a little bit, which was nice. When I got in the ring, because I only had 25 people there, you know, followed me, and all the rest were Mexican, all screaming at me. But, what was what was nice was when when it, it took about ten minutes before he got in the ring, and a lot of people do that, you know, a lot of fighters do that because they want you to to look out of the crowd and they're all baying you and shouting at you and going on, and it, it sort of can frighten you a little bit. But I was I was putting my arms up like as if to say, where is he? Doesn't he want to fight? And everyone was like, yeah, yeah, and obviously, yeah. yeah. What happened? I, I I was in the ring for about ten minutes. 12, 15 minutes before he came in. And they do that in some countries. It's just a fright in you. You're looking around, people baying you, shouting at you. But anything like that doesn't bother me because I'm always the old school. I think, well, no one else is going to get in the ring, only the boxer. It's only going to be us two. It doesn't matter where it is. We're in the ring. That's the way to look at it. And so I, I was going, like, where is he? Where is he? And the next thing, he came in the ring and I clapped. 
And then I, you know, went over to him and put my, my arm on him. And everybody, you could not believe how the crowd cheered me. And it made so much difference, you know. And I still get people coming up to me today saying, I watched you clap him in the ring. Unbelievable you did that, you know. And it was total respect, like I say. Yeah, no, no, nice. But I suppose in an in a intricate and subtle way, a little bit of gamesmanship, knowing that you were confident. I mean, that for me just expresses a lot of confidence. And, and yeah, I mean, uh, that's, that's belief right there. I was very confident. And, do you, do you know, I was saying this, we were talking about this the other day. You know, um, Ricky Hatton, when he went over to America, to Vegas, yeah, he fought, he, he, um, yeah, he used to have three or 4,000 people go over there. But when I boxed him in Mexico, I had 24, 25 people come out. And the reason being is the difference. When, if you go back to 1975, which is unbelievably 45 years ago, I don't know where the time's gone, but if you, if you look at that time, and, uh, you, you know, in, in sort of 1975, to go over there, people were only earning about 40 quid a week. Okay. And over then, you, you know, you had to you had not only get a ticket, but you had to, the, the flight and everything, it was something like four or 500 quid for someone to go. Well, if you look at that today, that's probably about 10 grand, eight grand. Nice. You know what I mean? But now you can go to America for like a thousand pounds. Yeah, no, exactly. So that's why Ricky got so many crowds over because it was cheap to go. But in my day, it wasn't cheap to go. That's why I only had 24, 25 people come over. And, um, and you remained professional for nine years, uh, having, nine having, years yeah. having, having a really good sort of legacy. And, um, yeah. And then post, post career, uh, you, you brought a pub, yeah? Well, I, I had the pub in 76 to 1980, okay. uh, the Durham Arms uh, there. But there was a pub in, in um, a friend of mine got in uh, Norfolk, uh, Norwich, and it was called the John H. Tracy. Beautiful. Uh, but that wasn't mine. I just opened it for him, and he, he was there for a few years, you know. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Having, the, a, uh, name. having a pub named after you, that's pretty awesome. Well, I, I'll tell you something. This is absolutely true. Nine, um, when was it? 1974. Um, I'd won the European title in Paris, believe it or not, <laughs> against uh, a guy called Roger Menetre, who was, who was uh, French. And um, a, guy, uh, a guy came over from Belgium. Ray Van Laken, his name was. And he named a boxing club after me in Belgium. John H. Tracy Boxing Club. And believe it or not, I was the first person in the world to have a boxing club named after. Is that right? Isn't that amazing? That is amazing. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. that is amazing. Yeah. So, are, so are, you, um, yeah, are, you, things happen. are you still um, involved in any training at all of any respect? Or well, I, I helped to uh, run an amateur boxing club we have got here, cool. um, Seacom and Allendale Amateur Boxing Club. Nice. Um, but I, I, you know, I still go around gyms and still do a lot for amateur boxing and and I do you know do, do a few shows here and there uh, and, cabaret yeah. shows and and I do uh, like a lot of uh, but mostly it's um charity you know most charity work singing and and doing doing memorabilia and you know all, all different stuff all different stuff amazing amazing and um and obviously modern you know bringing bringing your career right forward to where we are right now uh, so you're still doing quite a lot of compare work and um, you like no all different stuff, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All, all different stuff, really. Um, you're going to break into. I'm, I'm, I'm too. very lucky oh, that I can God. do. Uh, no, sorry, you're going to break into. I'm song very for lucky. Me. Say it again. <laughs> you're going to break into song for me. <laughs> yeah, no, too early. <laughs> now, what I was going to say was, you know, I'm very fortunate that I can I can do what I do. There's not. I, I'm not sure if there's many boxers who do, who can do like cabaret, um, who do. Uh, I, I've got you know okay, uh, MC. I can do MC, master of ceremonies on on boxing shows. Um, I can you know there's there's nothing I can't do in that sense. So I'm very fortunate That's that cool. I can do all that. That's cool. And and to own the story that you do is is is, is awesome. Yeah, and, and also I'll tell you one other story which is fantastic and 
And I always say this, if, Mark, this is absolutely true. If I'd never have won the world title, right, which obviously is every fighter's goal, um, and I'm very fortunate to have done it, a um, lot of hard work, obviously, but you do need a little bit of luck in your life, and, and I will say that with any, anything, but the hard work has is, is got to be put in. Um, but I always say this, if I'd never won anything in my life, when I boxed on the Muhammad Ali bill, in Mex uh, in um, Las Vegas, so I'm thinking of it. In Las Vegas in 1973, um, meeting Muhammad Ali and what what happened that took the time. You know, if I'd never won a world title, that would have been the greatest moment of my career to box on the Muhammad Ali bill. And I met Elvis. You know, Elvis Presley. Um, he was he was in our dressing room. Um, there was you know Frank Sinatra, Sammy Davis, Dean Martin. And then you had the boxers there, um, Joe Lewis, who was the uh, greeter of Caesar's Palace. And then you had Sugar Ray Robinson, who was my idol. He was my idol. And, you know, the greatest boxer has ever been pound for pound. So at that time when I saw that, I saw Elvis live as well, singing live. That was the greatest moment for me. But obviously, when you box, you want to win titles. And so I was lucky to, to win them as well. So... It's amazing. Yeah, and, yeah. And great, great, great times. It's been compelling just to listen to all of these. I mean, that, that <laughs> era of so many greats uh, and, and obviously of a, a changing changing time, really, in a, in a, in a lifetime. Um, but age 15, uh, if, if I don't mind just rewinding back a little bit. So age 15, where you were growing up, and obviously we mentioned, obviously, you know, it was a, it was a bit of a, a hard time and a little bit of poverty as well right there. And, and that's where you oh, left. Yeah. Right? But yeah. Obviously, if you don't mind me mentioning this, but obviously the, you actually witnessed the carnage of, of, of the Cray legacy a little bit, yeah? Yeah, I'll tell you what happened. No, this is a fact. Um, our buildings where we lived in Collingwood House was at the back of the Blind Beggar, you know. So if you come out of the Blind Beggar, turn left. The go, about 100, uh, go about 120 yards. That was our buildings. That was the start of our buildings, a big estate called Collingwood Estate. And I lived Collingwood House. So I was like immediately behind it. And that particular night, I think it was the 10th of, of 15th of March, something like that, uh, 66, I was, I was 15. We were sitting downstairs uh, in our garden. There's like a little garden there um, with a fence going around the estate, you know. And all the lads, we used to sit there doing nothing, sometimes playing football in the, in the park. But then we'd sit there till eight or nine or 10 o'clock before we went back upstairs again. And uh, all of a sudden we saw this, this uh, ambulance go by, me, 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 like that. We thought, what's happening? All of a sudden it stopped. And then we saw police cars coming everywhere and then stopped. And we thought, it must be just up the road here, you know, it must be just on the end of Whitechapel. So we, we ran up to Whitechapel, as I say, one, one minute, and uh, everyone was out at the Blind Beggar, all on the pavement. And we were all wondering, you know, what was going on. And uh, someone said they'd been shot, as a guy had been shot. And of course, it turned out to be Ronnie Cray shot Georgie Cornell. Um, and so, but I used to go to school with Gary Cray, who was uh, the nephew. Um, of, of the Cray twins and we used to go to school together and sometimes I'd knock on the door uh, where, where he lived in Valence Road, 178 Valence Road and uh, we'd go to school together. Sometimes we'd go in a car or sometimes we'd walk. So, you know, I, I grew up with, with all that but no one knew any different. You know, Cray, the Crays then used to help a lot of people yeah. but, all, but we know what they were doing wrong. It was, you know, like Robin Hood. <laughs> that's how it was and and they done you know they helped a lot of old people out but we all know what was happening 1996 but, you know, the, the, can you believe that that's the last time that england won the world cup i mean it must have been a great yeah. time to, it must have been a great time to be you know be around and and, and obviously as a kid yeah it was growing up yeah and, i mean when we won the world cup where we live, we had this uh, football pitch and we went straight down the football pitch as we won. We all come running out of the buildings. We went downstairs into the football ground and we're all, you know, I was a big Jimmy Greaves fan. He was my hero, Jimmy Greaves. I'm a Spurs fan. And so as a kid, ah, oh, Jimmy Greaves. 
because he didn't play in the final, I was gutted. But, you know, obviously we won it. So you've, you've got to say that uh, Alf Ramsey done the right thing. Well, um, but, um, I never miss an opportunity, John. I mean, rewinding back to almost a year ago to the date now, Champions League final. I'm, you, you're going to hate who I support, but uh, oh, I can tell now, right away. I, I, I'm, 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 I follow, uh, I follow the Reds. So, um, I mean, we yeah. didn't play well that night, did we? We and we got a bit lucky, if I'm honest. But I'll take, I'll take luck. I'll take luck, like you said. You need a bit of luck. Yeah, do you, do you know? I'll tell you a quick story. My my favourite footballer when I was a kid, other than obviously Jimmy Greaves, my hero, but when it was the World Cup, I was 15, and my my best player for me was Alan Ball, right? I loved Alan Ball because he was small, he was only 21 and he was like the little runt of it but what a player, you know, running here, running there and um, and so what I started doing was from 1966 to about 82, I followed all his career with Everton and so I become a bit of an Evertonian Amazing. would you believe? And so I was a you know, I, I wasn't a red man, I was a blue man. But the but what happened, as soon as he went to Arsenal, that was it. Yeah. I was finished with him. <laughs> I, um, and I used to do after I used to do after dinner speaking with Alan as well. He was a great guy. I was actually and really so, fortunate to play play golf, um, with a obviously it would have been a big hero of yours also being a Tottenham fan and I think he he held the, the best record of goals scored and that was Clive Allen. Yeah, forty nine he scored. Amazing, yeah. Year. Were, uh, incredible. He was, I know, he was a great player. But Jimmy Greaves, I mean, come on. That that man is like historic. He, he you know, he, I don't think he ever scored outside the box. It was all little jinx and stuff like that, you know. No, and do you know a funny really... story? When, when 1963, we actually played in the European Cup final, which is the Champions League today. Now, if we, we lost in the semi final, I think, to Benfica. And not ben, uh, was it Benfica? Yeah, Benfica. And we lost. But Jimmy Greaves scored two goals, which they give, um, you know, which they didn't give. They, they ruled them offside and whatever. But they did a, a, a picture, sorry, they did a film of it a few months ago. And if it had been VAR, they would have stood because they were good goals. There wasn't nothing wrong with them. Yeah, no. So we could have been the first championship winners, you know. What's what's your take on VAR? Do, do you like it? I mean, last year we, we saw lots. Um, I've, of I've got two, I'm in two minds with it. I think sometimes you've just got to go with what the referee says. It's like in boxing, you know. I, I could turn around and say, I didn't nut him, but the referee can go, oi, you know, you've nutted him, you're going to get disqualified. So, you, you, you know, you've just got to do what the referee says. I'm not really a big VAR man because sometimes... You know, it's it's a, a lot of it is all off the cuff, yeah. And so it's like boxing. It's changing, so you've, you've, changing the momentum, isn't it? Of the game. Yeah, I mean, a referee, apart from just doing it now, he, he's got no say. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's wrong. I think the referee's got to be the main man, like the boxing referee. Yeah, indeed. So anyway, John, it's been an absolute pleasure to to talk all about your career and legacy, oh. and, um, and 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 I really do hope that we uh, we can meet up and. Yeah, play some golf and yeah, yeah get, that'll be fantastic. It'll be great. So uh, fantastic. Yeah. So no, it's been an absolute pleasure, and um, you've been plugged. Ah, oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. That's you, very good, and yeah. I hope, hope to meet you soon and uh, have a game of golf. Look forward to it. You've been an absolute star. And if Kevin's listening, which I hope he is, Kev, thanks very much, mate. Kevin Baker, absolutely, thank top you man. Very much.